Okay, everybody. Um, this is covering uh, some of the week four chapters. We have some separate videos that are going to be delineated on our module. So uh, just take a look at it. Um, there's going to be a video about the media, World War II, the Cold War, the Great Depression, and the Electoral College. So I think with this video here, I'm going to include the media and the Electoral College uh, and World War II, the, the Great Depression, and... Um, the Cold War are going to be covered under videos that I've already uh, made. Um, not much has changed. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's no sense in reinventing the wheel. So some of these things that we're going to talk about in political science change constantly. So I don't really like using previous videos. So I try to do as, as accurate as possible. And so today's uh, recording date is June 19th. Um, the, 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 we're still a couple of weeks away from this chapter as I record, so, you know, obviously things might have changed slightly in, in our, you know, in some of our stuff, but just keep in mind of that date. So we're going to talk about the media and the media's influence on politics, and one of the questions this week is going to be about TMZ and how TMZ serves maybe as a, as a resource for, for people here in the United States as far as getting their news. Um, so the people that control the news are among the most powerful people in our country, whether it's Rupert Murdoch, um, uh, Les Moonves, uh, Disney, all these people that control media can also see themselves as a active participant in politics. They can, you know, in a sense, report disasters, report events, give us uh, uh, meanings to events, um, determine what's important, and it's at times challenge government officials and define what might be the problems in society. If you look at this link, this is going to show how most of the masses get their news. I'm going to go ahead and spoil this for you. Most of the masses get their news from mobile devices. And that's, you know, something that's kind of been in vogue in the past four or five years that, you know, I have uh, Channel 10, 10 News here in San Diego. I have notifications that they send when certain news events happen. Um, some people might have CNN. Some people might have Fox. Some people might, might have MSNBC. But for the most part, we all use kind of our mobile devices to get our news. When we talk about the media and kind of the myth of the mirror, um, part of our media elites claim that, you know, their actions simply mirror reality. And the media has the power to elevate some national issues and ignore others, um, elevate obscure people and, you know, reward some politicians. And we look at Twitter and then we usually can see people saying, well, why isn't this news? Um, there might be some instances where the news media might repress certain stories. There's some instances where the news media might also kind of push up stories that we may not think are as important. Um, and, you know, people as well, you know, we, we have obscure people who are elevated. You know, uh, I didn't know what a Kardashian was until the O.J. Simpson case, right, in 1995, 96. And now they're part of our everyday lexicon, right? Um, if we look at 2020, here are the newspapers with the biggest circulations. Now, I couldn't get a real definition on what these numbers involved. Was this home delivery or were these a home delivery included in people going out and buying a paper at a newsstand or Starbucks or whatever? And I understand now Starbucks isn't really selling newspapers anywhere. So what I guess this is trying to, to come out of this is that we look at these numbers, we can see a lot of these papers are located in highly populated areas like New York, L.A., Chicago, uh, D.C., uh, which isn't really that populated, but outside D.C., Virginia, Maryland, um, kind of that beltway area is, is, is a lot of people. Um, so it's kind of like may, might be a little bit misleading, but let's just keep, you know, take a look at it and understand that USA Today has the largest readership. And obviously, this isn't counting hits on websites either because that number would be bigger. We're just, I guess, we're just talking per circulation here. What are the functions of the media? You know, they decide what and who are newsworthy, what's allocated TV time and space accordingly. Uh, they can create events, issues, personalities, much like what we just talked about. They can also interpret the news, you know, give news meaning. Um, newsmakers provide the masses with explanations and meanings for events and personalities. This is done through news specials like Dateline or maybe there was an old show that I used to watch when I was younger, uh, 2020. I'm not quite sure if it's on anymore, but it used to be a news program, you know, some very, very interesting stuff that was put on. And then we have our traditional ideological talk shows like Carlson, Hannity, um, you know, uh, Rachel Maddow, 
which you know kind of push across more of an ideology as opposed to in, in essence news stories the news media can also socialize us they teach us what the elites prefer political norms and values are through news and entertainment and we pretty much can understand which candidate is going to be for what issue and how they handle and all of that um social media has also become a very very important tool in not only news making but also campaigning when we talk about campaigns and elections we're going to talk about the influence that social media has on it and it's a very very profound influence now blogs individual run run websites you know do have an effect but i think if we would rank stuff in order it would be for the most part social media you know things like twitter instagram facebook that can reach a vi a wide variety of of audience in a short amount of time and the best thing about these things are they're free right you know you can still have blogs or like what a lot of people call now vlogs where they you know upload a video to youtube and use it as a way to influence people websites can cost money um you know just for the hosting and um the maintenance but for the most part you know a lot of our socialization comes through social media the news can also persuade us how to feel a certain way right this occurs when government or corporations, much we, what we learned about in interest groups chapter, corporations, union, unions, parties, they can all make attempts to affect people's beliefs, attitudes, or behavior. And we see this through commercials or maybe talk shows or stuff like that where we have campaigns that are showing what might be the concerns of the candidates and in a sense also trying to influence the masses on how to act. Uh, you know, and there's a time where the candidates used to really rely on on the news media to help push their message across. Um, let me back, uh, you know, that's what's happening now. Before, they used to really use the party, right? The party would spread the messages, but now there is an increasingly reliance on the news media and social media to, pro to, to provide that conduit between the candidate and the voter they can also set the agenda and this is probably the most powerful tool that they have they can decide what is newsworthy and what is not they can keep news stories out and they can also keep uh, make sure news stories get addressed a uh, political elites decide on solutions to problem while media elites are going to determine what those problems are so when we talk about you know kind of the picture of the United States here in the news media in in TV shows, there's an overwhelmingly bias toward negative stories here in the United States, and we like bad news. Bad news is good news. Good news doesn't stir audience interest. Bad news will sell papers. Bad news will get ratings. And you know, in entertainment programs, you know, things like maybe like CSI or or. Uh, Law and Order, or some of these programs on um, entertainment programs reinforce the negative picture of life in the U.S. Uh, murder is the least uh, common crime here in, in the world, but it's the far most common crime on TV. You know, traditionally, we've had instances where reputable newspapers haven't reported on the sex lives of political figures today it's no limits and i think we can trace that all the way back to the clinton administration um now whether or not that matters to voters it's that's a whole other story right but what we could see is that entertainment has become per, be you know progressively sex obsessed and profanity ridden um you know we could talk about morals and we could talk about what should be on TV and what shouldn't be on TV and what should be regulated and what should not be regulated. But for the most part, I think what we could figure out is that we look with, you know, real stories. Um, the sex lives of the candidates aren't as important as it used to be. And I think now, you know, uh, people can use that as an argument to maybe vote for the the candidate that has better morals or morals that might allow align with you uh but it's not as as important as we used to have it 
a lot of the time, some of this uh, issues and some of these things that come out on TV, such as scandal and corruption, can cause us to lose trust in government. And it creates kind of a television malaise where we have a cynicism toward government. And while mainstream violence and sex may be an expression of freedom under the First Amendment, it ignores the freedom of persons who must now live in a society where we have, you know, brutality glorified and denigration of women glorified. So, you know, it can create that sense of, of malaise or that sense of lack of confidence or trust in governments in the institutions that the government represents. Um, let's go ahead and go to this. It's kind of, this is all self-explanatory, so we're not going to go too in-depth in this. One big uh, portion of our media is the Hollywood liberals, right? And these are actors or actresses or... or um, maybe news personalities that have a liberal bias toward news. Um, Hollywood plays an important role in socializing young people to the political world. Um, and these people are more likely to be Democrat than Republican. And it's something that is pretty widely known. And, you know, we've had instances where uh, there has been situations where maybe personalities like DiCaprio or Ben Affleck or, or you know, Taylor Swift have come out and made statements in support of a candidate and you know that's really going to have some weight and it's really going to might motivate that person in the middle who doesn't know who to vote on for yet this is another thing that i want to talk about it's called no prior restraint um, freedom of the press has been interpreted to mean the government may not censor items um, if the government wants to keep military secrets secret, the best thing is to make sure that they don't get in the hands of the news media or in the hands of somebody that could dump them on a website like WikiLeaks. So if the government wants to keep military secrets secret, they need to make sure it doesn't fall into the hands of the wrong people. Now, am I for censoring news? Absolutely not. But are there things that we are probably better off not knowing? I, I think that's something that's fair to say. Like there's if there's something that affects military or national security, obviously I don't think we as the people need to know about it unless it could potentially be a scandal or something. Uh, now, we have some things that aren't protected by the First Amendment with as far as the news media. Um, libel and slander. Libel is written, slander is spoken, and these are falsehoods that are made about people that could create a negative effect to their reputation, and these aren't protected by uh, the First Amendment. And in order for these to be constitutional or to be allowable, there has to be an absence of malice. There is something called the Sullivan Rule. And there's a court case called New York Times versus Sullivan where the actual malice uh, standard requires that the plaintiff in a defamation or a libel case must be able to show that the statements made by the other side were false and acted in reckless disregard of its truth or falsity. So basically, this really puts a high burden on the plaintiff to prove that the defendant's intentions were done with malice. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to hard to prove, and public figures will rarely prevail in these situations. The internet has also become a major source of news, uh, particularly for younger people and more educated people. Like we talked about, as of July 2017, the internet has a penetration rate of 88.5%. I checked some figures uh, for July 2020, and it was roughly the same, even though I think it's still a little bit understated. I wouldn't be surprised if it is up to 95%, but I couldn't find anything to substantiate that. The news media isn't the only way government agencies can provide services to people. The, uh, you know, federal agencies maintain websites which might give information about certain things, might give you the ability to pay fees, might give you the ability to, uh, you know, do some type of, of, of research. But what we can truly say is that the internet cannot be restricted. There was something called the Communications Decency Act of 1996, and this attempted to outlaw indecent and offensive material on the internet. This was declared unconstitutional in 1997, and it basically says that the government can't limit the adult population to consume what is only fit for children. 
So basically what it's saying is the government cannot censor the internet. And when we talk about obscenities and stuff like that, we'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a future class. Because there's going to be some tests that you could put material through to see whether it's indecent or not. But we do have a bureaucracy that checks on whether or not something is considered to be indecent. The Federal Communications Commission is an independent agency or a bureaucracy that um, will show... Hold on, I lost it real quick. That will, sh will, will regulate... Uh, interstate communication by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable. Like I said, this is part of the executive branch and it's bureaucracy where the head is appointed by the president. Um, they monitor free airwaves. Uh, there's a gentleman named Howard Stern who had a radio show on uh, over-the-air radio from 1990 to 2004. Um, he was issued a fine, fines totaling two and a half million dollars. Um, and again, you know, it could be very subjective, right? Something that might not be offensive to you might be offensive to me. Uh, Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake, uh, during a Super Bowl performance in 2004, Jackson's breast was exposed for 9 sixteenths of a second, right? CBS fined CBS $550,000 for that. This was eventually overturned by the Supreme Court. And a five-second delay is now required to be on... All live performances. Saving Private Ryan, which is actually one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, traditionally, this was played on Veterans Day on November 11th. Um, in the wake of the Jackson Timberlake incident, television stations were afraid to air the movie unedited. It has a lot of foul language and a lot of violent warrant images. Uh, finally, the FCC later decided that the movie was not obscene. And stations were able to play it on air unedited. Um, you know, we talk about politics in the internet. You know, social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter all have an immense amount of influence. And, you know, they've kind of taken over the link between the candidate and the voter as opposed to the party being the link between the candidate and the voter. Um, you know, a lot of these coverages of news and um, uh, presidential races or Senate races or ho horse, I mean, or House of Representative races, like kind of lead to something called horse race reporting. We always know who's ahead, who's behind, and a lot of negative coverage. And we also have things like sinking, shrinking sound bites, which is the average sound bite is about eight minutes, eight seconds. Sorry, and um, you know you can't get really good context out of an eight second. Um, uh, sound bite, so it's something that needs to be, you know, kind of taken into con taken into account when you hear these. Uh, we have late night laughs, things like SNL, um, uh, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, um, and then we also have, you know, maybe for the younger voter uh, voters, things like The Daily Show and Last Week Tonight, which are not late night, but they uh, they have a, a very good influence on how people think and how people look at politics. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at World War II.